Um, I'm just going to talk about the general uh, context, really, and about what's happening with protests, um, both here and abroad, really. Uh, what we're seeing, I think, and, and it's not surprising in lots of ways, um, given the era of austerity that we're living under, that there's a global crackdown on protests. We see laws being hurried through, Law 78 in Quebec, particular emergency laws um, designed to kind of crush protests because it's working. We see... Uh, in UC Davis, um, there are some students in a lecture there currently looking at 11 years and $1 million uh, fines each um, for the crime of sitting outside a campus bank um, um, that later closed down. So 11 years for that. Um, we'll see what happens. We've seen, of course, utterly disproportionate sentences um, for the uprising stroke riots, um, which has been discussed in other other sessions, um, there's clearly uh, incredibly violent crackdowns in Egypt and elsewhere. It's, it's a global kind of situation. Um, at the same time, we have something like a kind of paradox of protest, um, where the moment protest starts to be effective, it's no longer described as a protest. It's described as a riot or something else, where a small minority um, are always blamed. Um, and it's very difficult for us, but we must win the argument about what is really violent um, in this situation. It's very, very easy for a kind of uh, a media fear to be generated around supposed violence, but it's nothing compared to what they're doing. And when we say, when we talk about defending the right to protest, we're talking about the right uh, to strike also. Um, and this is going to become increasingly an issue. Obviously, the erosion of, of uh, laws and the right to strike have been going on for a long time now. Um, Erosions against the right to protest, and these are rights that have been fought for, not given. And I don't want anyone to think that our campaign is a reformist campaign. Obviously, it has a legal di dimension, but it's a defensive campaign. Um, but it's also about protecting those rights um, that have been fought for. Um, and I'll just give you some, some examples of the way in which this right to protest and the right to strike have been eroded. It's, it's been eroded in the last few uh, months and years. Um, at the moment, uh, if you are on a, a, this uh, protester database, which uh, has, has recently come to light, um, which is a kind of separate <laughs> a list of names, often of people who've had charges dropped um, against them, or people who you know, were sort of taken in and their names taken, but no, no charge actually brought. Um, these people are receiving letters before big protests, warning them um, to be on their best behaviour. Um, we've obviously seen undercover police infiltrating protest groups, in particular the high-profile case of Mark Kennedy, um, where these, these undercover police are having relationships um, with protesters and often children, um, with activists, um, against the, you know, without their knowledge, and there are cases going through against these um, police. Um, we've seen um, pre-arrests and, and the royal wedding. We've seen people uh, before the Olympics receiving Olympic ASPOs, banning them from anywhere um, around where these events are taking place. And we get increasingly the feeling that the authorities and the police are treat, treating every event, every protest event, as something like training for the next event. You know, they're trying out things, basically, seeing what they can get away with. And how many of these dispersal zones that have been set up around Tower Hamlets um, will be left in place after the Olympics? And I think yeah. this is extremely worrying. Um, obviously, the crackdown on anyone standing around on the streets, you know, it's this kind of neoliberal fantasy that everyone should just scurry about on their own and run to the shop and run home, and that no one should be outside. Um, <laughs> we've seen, actually, one of the, the useful things that, you know, many useful and interesting things that the Occupy movement did was to reveal precisely how little public space there really is in a city like London. And this is a battle over what's left of that, and, and think about the kind of securitization and surveillance um, and the policing of the city, which means that there's very little of the public left. And, and, and obviously lots of these sentences are, well, they're all uh, uh, charged in the name of, of, of public order. But who is this public um, that is so scared by protesters, who's so scared by what's happening? It's not a real public, it's the ghost public that the, the law will always invoke to punish the real public, which is us. Um, Okay, and just to talk a little bit about what the campaign has been doing lately. Um, okay, more than 100 charges were brought against protesters following the four main student demos of, of 2010. Um, and of those who pled guilty or are found guilty by a jury, custodial sentences of between 6 and 32 months um, were handed out. Um, and obviously these are even more excessive um, and, and, you know, literally disproportionate, I mean, you know, explicitly disproportionate sentences um, for the riots. And we have this kind of idea of this deterrent sentences that the judge is constantly saying, both in the student and the riot cases. 
Um, but in a way, all sentences are deterrent sentences. I mean, of course they are. Um, so early high-profile cases, Edward Woolard, who pled guilty, um, following Milbank, Charlie Gilmore, who made the mistake of having a famous stepfather, and first-time protester Frank Fernie, who got a year's sentence for throwing two placard sticks, um, provided the media and the government with useful scapegoats, and much was made by the judges as to the supposedly deterrent element of such lengthy jail terms. But what has become obvious, I think, working on the campaign, um, particularly with the less visible, uh, less sort of media, you know, attractive cases, and less publicly visible cases, is the way in which these protests are being punished several times over, and I really think this scapegoating um, thing is, is central. So people are often injured by the police during protests, often seriously, um, then charged, spending many months awaiting trial, tried, sent to prison, released, and then forced, um, a, you know, even more on top of that, to face humiliating paralegal committees set up by the very universities and colleges which the student have been fighting to preserve. Um, and this is one thing that I, I personally have found really shocking um, about the kind of complicity with some universities and colleges um, following the arrest and imprisonment of students, that they're not um, backing them, they're not supporting them when they come out of prison, despite the fact that these, these people have, you know, really sacrificed their, you know, their, their lives really to, to fight for this cause. Um, the stress of awaiting trial and living with the real threat of a jail, um, of jail sentence is obviously difficult enough uh, for both defendant, friends and family alike, but to afterwards have to face these so-called criminal conviction committees um, that are present in these universities and colleges with no guarantee of being allowed back to study adds a further punishment that one would hope most academics would want to resist in the utmost. Um, and I guess I'm particularly involved in trying to get academics to support um, students who've been arrested, but also to like, try and investigate these kind of creepy uh, criminal committees, like what the hell are universities doing playing um, you know, judge and, and jury. Um, and also, in a way, it makes a kind of um, mockery of the idea of rehabilitation, you know, as if uh, people used to talk about rehabilitation, you know, when you come out of jail, you know, education is one way of doing that. People, uh, including academics, don't seem to, to think this anymore. Um, but what we've been doing, um, along with you know, many of the people on these campuses, with petitions and meetings, um, particularly at Sussex and Kingston, where the students had been uh, imprisoned, um, where, the threat, um, where the threat of students going into occupation to protest the exclusion of fellow students who'd been in prison um, appears to have put the frightness on managers terrified that any bad pu publicity might impact on student numbers under the new fee regime. So we can actually use their kind of PR uh, paranoia to, to get them, to force them to, to let students back in and to not go through the humiliation of these committees. Um, as we saw waves of occupation um, in recent years in, in, on campuses um, over Israel's bombing of Gaza, the threat and closure of departments, um, the fee increase and cuts to arts and humanities funding um, have once again revealed the campus to be a serious site of political contestation, um, although this time around the increasing privatisation and securitisation of the contemporary campus um, has made it an even more complex nexus of forces than it was in the 60s, perhaps. Um, and so, for example, after a very brief uh, protest where, where I teach at Roehampton, um, which was ended very briefly after management lied to the students and said that the room that the students had occupied was filled with asbestos, when it wasn't, um, <laughs> and the, the, the university, despite undergoing massive cuts, and we're an arts and humanities institution, um, so we, we have 98% cuts, basically, um, to all their subjects, and nevertheless installed a million pound uh, security card swipe system. Um, and not even uh, normal staff are allowed in the management corridor, so our cards don't even work, you know, to get to them. Um, <laughs> so um, the banning of protests, as we saw at Birmingham Sheffield Universities in recent months, is a worrying sign, um, as is the proposal circulating at various institutions to use police officers as security guards on campuses. Um, this was thankfully vetoed by teaching staff at Goldsmiths, who realised, you know, that this was a really fucking bad idea. Um, the already existing instructions for teaching staff, like the kind of internal memos that we get, um, to monitor and report on Muslim students, which we've had for a long time, exhibiting any signs of fanaticism, to the authorities, was extended to incorporate domestic extremists, quote, um, under a broader definition, um, which would include sort of, uh, you know, angry students, students angry about politics, um, and counter-terrorist police, presumably because they didn't have much else to do, were heavily involved in the investigations and arrests of all the students um, in 2010. So it was counter-terrorist police who were doing dawn raids on students. 
Um, and back on campus, we get these kind of instructions from management as to what we're supposed to do in the event of a student occupation, and they're just completely weird. They say things like, you know, lock all your doors, don't try to reason with them, you know, <laughs> this kind of thing. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> there's obviously a kind of, you know, a really complex kind of, uh, you know, set of things um, that will erode the kind of right to protest and the right to occupy. Um, obviously, the, the kind of laws against squatting as well play into this. Um, so what can we do? Um, well, I think one thing is to to understand that the kind of the state repression, the police violence um, and the violence against protesters is on a continuum with the police violence um, that is daily meted out to people in the form of stop and search and so on and deaths in police custody. And I think one of the things that we need to work better at is to try and get, let's say, students who've had a bad experience on a demo with the police who are maybe shocked at the first time seeing police behave in this way and, and be charged by horses and hit by batons. Um, is to think about um, what it would be like to live with daily police harassment and daily police violence. And not to say that the experiences are remotely similar, but to try and understand that this is on a continuum um, and that if you support protesters, then you support people against this kind of harassment um, and that you, you support people who are, are struggling for justice for their families at, you know, following deaths in police custody um, and in asylum centres and elsewhere. Um, so we've been trying to link up with, and we are linking up, working with justice campaigns, um, other defence campaigns, local campaigns that, that do this stuff, that, that let people know about their rights, um, how not to, to, you know, to say things to the police. Um, and in terms of the court, uh, court support, working with legal defence and monitoring group, Green and Black Cross, there's obviously things people can do, and lots of people have been writing to people in prison, it obviously keeps people going. Um, one of the, the most important things, of course, is, is to get people to, to, to plead not guilty where that's appropriate, um, because obviously, you know, you plead guilty, you don't get a chance to do anything, you're just sent to jail. Um, we know that there are going to be many more protests and strikes, and I think we've got to be, um, even though we're a defence campaign, to be more preemptive, to, to let people know their rights, to, to let people know that, that, that there are groups and individuals and, and collectives behind them, you know, so people don't feel isolated, you know, that they're not forced into a position, which is exactly where the state wants you, where you feel like you've done something wrong when you haven't, you feel like they're out to get you, and, you know, everything they do in terms of the dawn raids and everything is designed to make you feel like this kind of that you're already a criminal. And having sat in on many of the court cases, um, it feels exactly like that, you know, that you've already been prejudged. And I think also to force institutions to not fucking collude in this criminalisation of students um, and other protesters and, and to, to make education really a site of, um, you know, resistance, um, to not be kind of colonised by police. Um, you know, there are kind of difficult questions about what happens with police privatisation. Um, and I think we've got to address them head on. Um, you know, we don't get justice now as it is, and that's a supposedly national police force. How much harder is it going to be um, when aspects of the police force are privatised? Um, but I think we need to, to sort of, d you know, address these directly. Um, and, and just in terms of the Olympics, for example, there's, there's the new monitoring project. Um, they've been around for since 1980. I've trained lots of community legal observers who'll be, um, you know, looking out for police behaviour. Um, because there's a kind of uh, really terrifying and, and um, uncertainty about well, how the police are going to behave. We've obviously got armed uh, troops uh, on the, you know, already. They're, they're already out in Leicester Square with their handcuffs, um, you know, backing up the police. Um, so I think we're in for a, a very uh, problematic, um, you know, summer and autumn, <laughs> but hopefully uh, one that we will win. Bye. Thank you will know the photographs of Alfie Meadows, which have become iconic, um, of um, Alfie after he'd been struck with a baton on the student protest on the 9th of December. He was hospitalised, had to have life-saving brain surgery. He is now facing trial for violent disorder following a complaint that he made about police violence. I encourage everybody to support Alfie's campaign. You'll see stickers, wear them with pride, put them on your bags. But also, Alfie is facing a retrial on the 29th of October, and I encourage everyone to come to Kingston Crown Court. The Defender Rights Project all outside. Um, thank you, everyone. <laughs> um, uh, uh, today, I'm wearing the um, the uh, Quebec um, red badge. 
And obviously that's been um, amazingly inspiring. The, uh, the student protests we were involved in were amazingly inspiring and I hope, I hope that um, we see something like um, we're seeing in Quebec in, um, here in Britain in the autumn. Um, I, um, I'm going to say a bit about, so I, I was involved in a struggle to save the philosophy department at Middlesex University, which is where I study. Um, they announced the closure. We, uh, we occupied with students and staff. We had disciplinary hearings. Um, uh, since then, many other uh, universities, uh, post 19 universities, have closed philosophy departments. Um, this is the background when I got involved in the student protests. Um, we know what we, were, we went out against. We went out against the trebling of tuition fees, cuts to EAM, AMA, marketization of higher education, which goes hand in hand with job losses and attacks on working, the attacks on working conditions of academic and admin staff. As we know, this is part of a massive attack on the working class, and in particular the young, and under the guise of austerity measures. The students knew that back then, and I think we can all remember the, the text messages that were sent from the roof of Tory HQ when it was occupied, um, proclaiming support, solidarity of all those struggling against cuts. Um, but of course, the trapping of the tuition fees um, was also about any political legitimacy, um, as none of these cuts are. And what we saw in the streets then and since, in Britain and across the world, is that the state is using force and repression to push through cuts that the people are resisting. The student uprising smashed the consensus of austerity, and that is very important to keep in mind um, when we have this autumn coming up with the TUC demo, the strikes, and the student nas another national student demonstration. Um, so, on the uh, 9th of December, as uh, Shana said, I was smashed in the head with a baton. Uh, many other people were hit, uh, uh, suffered violence, violence that day, and it's only luck that um, no one else faced injuries like I did. Um, we were bat we were kettled, charged with horses, battened, um, and in the aftermath, um, it said hundreds um, hundreds were arrested and many were prosecuted. Um, after after I brought a case um, against the police, I was prosecuted along with four others. We had a trial in March. Three of us were acquitted, and that was a victory. Um, you don't get many of them, and it was important. And um, I've got the retrial again in October. Um, so as you know, the people, 100 were arrest, um, hunters were arrested, around 100 were prosecuted, and uh, around 50 of them, or 60, with the most second most serious public order offence, which carries a maximum of five years in prison. And many people did go to prison, especially the people who pleaded guilty at the beginning. The legal process is very isolating, from the point of arrest to the interrogation room, waiting on bail for a year and sometimes more, going to court, sitting on trial, possibly going to prison. The experience of, is individualising, is one of powerlessness, and it makes it so difficult to continue to work, to study, and to fight against cuts and injustice. I know from my experience and from that of many other people who I've met through the whole protest, uh, process, sitting in um, other people's cases, just how important collective support is. Um, it makes a massive difference just you know, receiving the confidence and the practical support and the legal advice to whether you can fight against these charges and whether you have the possibility of winning. Um, and also, you know, the people who are fighting, they deserve the solidarity for fighting against the cuts and facing this. But I think it also makes a big difference to the movement if people are winning. It, um, it begins to turn the tide on the state repression and it encourages people not to be put off by the obvious repression we're seeing on the streets and to go out and fight. Um, the work of Defend Right to Protest has been essential in this whole process for me and for everyone else. And we've had some really good victories. One of them was um, the Heliard brothers. They were accused of pulling two officers off their horse on the night for December demonstration. Um, and the day after, David Cameron, not showing the kind of restraint he usually does when his rich chums are facing charges, came out in the media and said, all oh, these thugs, they pulled the officer off his horse, they should go to prison. What actually happened was, was the um, officer had forgot to tighten up his um, saddle strap and then had pulled the guy's hair so much that he's actually on his tiptoes and that's what caused him to fall off. Um, so there are lots of stories like that and um, it was part of this, you know, they needed a lot of support, even though that case was blindingly obvious. They still needed to do massive amounts of work to get all the evidence themselves, to fight against the whole process. Unless you have that kind of support, it's almost impossible. Um, this is 
obviously true for the student protests, it's true for cases in the riots as well, where people, exactly the same, it's even more difficult when you're on remand, uh, when you're not given bail, you're in prison, you might be in prison for eight months until you're still waiting for a trial, how are you meant to organise a defence? You know, it's, it's impossible and people are going to plead guilty at that point. So the kind of principles that we've been uh, using in this case, defending people against um, repression on the streets must be extended to other cases and I don't know if you were in that amazing session before on the, the riots, but there are some campaigns which are getting up as well, like Tottenham Defence Campaign, Stop Criminalising Hacking um, Youth, and it's really important that we link all these struggles up together. Um, part of the work of Defend Right to Protest has been precisely to do that, um, to link these struggles up, because like I said, the support of students, workers, community campaigns and trade unions has been so massive for us. Um, as well as that, um, like Nina has said, we've had um, uh, support from justice campaigns, the deaths in police custody. Just this week I've been um, sat in on two cases uh, this week, both in Southwark. First is the, um, the Southwark Coroner's uh, Court, which is the Sean Rigg inquest. And um, Sean Rigg died in Brixton Police Station in 2008, and it's taken four years for his family. They've had to fight the whole time to just get to this point of an inquest. They've had to fight against the police against the IPCC, against the state, non-stop. And their fight is incredible and they've given us massive confidence and we need to give that support back. And the other case has been the Tomlinson uh, case, which you probably have heard about. And that's um, Simon Harwood. He's facing um, uh, charges, manslaughter charges. And we need to give them all, all the support, obviously, because it's a horrific thing and, and they need to uh, win justice. But it's been 40 years of uh, thousands of deaths in police custody and not a single successful... There's been one prosecution in 1969, not one since then. And um, if, if they get a prosecution there, that gives them a real message that, they have, that there is a tiny bit of accountability and that actually they might think twice again about doing whatever they want. And we need to be going out as part of the autumn coming up. We need to have the TUC demo, the strikes and the student demo in our calendar, but also the United Friends and Family campaign which is um, on the 27th of October, on the Saturday, and we need to show support. Um, Defend Rights of Protest has also got a conference coming up in that time, that's October the 14th, um, and we'll be trying to get all these struggles, linking them up together, about the d justice campaigns, about the student protests, about the attacks on the right to strike, um, and about the riots, and, um, and about our history, and it'll be really important at that point, because Part of what we need to do is we need to defend people, give the practical support, but we also need to know our rights. We need to make sure that we know what to do when we come up, when we're on protest on the picket line, when we come face to face with the police, um, uh, when we see someone else get arrested, um, and when they go to court, we need to make sure no one's isolated because um, that will, that's their aim to break our movement. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, the defence campaign, uh, the role of the defence campaign is to enable us to go out and protest. Um, to protest against injustice, against the cuts, and um, the collective support and solidarity is so essential for that. And um, I'd like to thank everyone for all the support I've received and all the support all the students have received. And uh, I hope you see, um, I'll see you on the t uh, TUC march. And hopefully, when I see you on the November 21st student demo, I'll be acquitted. And I say thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sean. Um, I wanted to. Um start with uh, trying to explain how they deal with protests through a comparison between two people at the opposite extreme of the, th of the thing in terms of the student protest. Uh, two Pauls. Uh, the, the first is Sir Paul Stevenson, who inexplicably resigned last year. It was really um, difficult to understand why he had resigned. The, uh, uh, Theresa May said she regretted he resigned. And he said, my integrity is completely intact in his res resignation statement, which, which sort of raises the question, why did he resign at all from the top job in the police on £260,000 a year, having made it to the top if his integrity was completely intact? And to, I mean, you can, in fact, substitute his name for Bob Diamond in this story. It's, it's, very, it's not dissimilar in terms of the way the people at the top are treated. This is the man, just to remind you, who, who was asked about the policing of the second student protest, about the horse charge, and he said there wasn't a horse charge. Unfortunately, he was then shown a bit of YouTube footage and had to <laughs> retract the whole thing. But the, when you look at the facts 
um, it may explain why he resigned so quickly. He had uh, a free five-week stay at the luxury Chantney's Health Farm. That fact alone uh, shocked Brian Paddock, an ex-police officer. He said, if you're going about on the beat, you don't take money from anybody just in case it could compromise you. Uh, but there was much worse. The, the uh, managing director of the public relations for Chapney's Health was a man called Neil Wallace, who happened by coincidence to be the same person who Paul Stevenson employed as his public relations uh, officer on £1,000 a day. He was the same man who was the former executive of the News of the World. The same News of the World that the police had failed miserably to investigate twice. Uh, and have, he was later arrested. And worse than that, this man, Sir Paul Stevenson, had 12 meetings with the News of the World during that period where they failed to investigate the News of the World. And even worse than that, he went to The Guardian on taxpayers' money, took time out of his diary to go to The Guardian in December 2009 and argue with them against this story on hacking at all. Why are you covering this story on hacking? That's what Sir Paul Stevenson did. So I think you can see why he resigned so quickly. Now I'd like to compare his, what happened to him and, and his dishonesty, if you like, with, with this, this student protester, Paul Akinyemi, who, who's um, allowed me to talk about his case. A uh, young black man from Hackney, working class family. His mother is a prison, uh, prison nurse. Um, and had a difficult, t a man of good character, had a difficult time at school, was looking like, you know, he might be suspended or excluded, and turned it around and won an award in Hackney for having turned around his life so amazingly within, within a year. Um, then has the prospect of going to university, a, a fantastic uh, achievement within his family. They're very proud of him. And then suddenly the Liberal Democrats come along. And having promised not to introduce tuition fees, they then get into government and introduce tuition fees. And that has a massive effect, particularly on his life, about whether he's even going to be able to afford to go uh, and whether he's going to be able to have his gap year that he planned to have. And he joins tens of thousands of people. You know the story. But he ends up in Millbank along with hundreds of other people. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lad with a hammer hammering the window inside Millbank. He goes across and takes the hammer and hits the window once, gives it back, and uh, expresses his anger in that way. Three months later, there's a dawn raid on his house, taken out of his house, taken to the police station, given the usual lines, you don't need a solicitor, it's all right, we can all deal with this ourselves, we don't want to waste time with a solicitor. Goes into interview, uh, admits the offence, uh, completely honest, uh, in fact, more than honest, th thought he'd done more than he had but which the with the video which is subsequently shown to him in interview. And um, he goes home and then three months later he's charged with violent disorder. And he comes to court about three weeks later and he's sat on his own at court and he hasn't told anyone that he's, this has happened, he hasn't told his family or anything. And he's just about to walk into court and plead guilty, and inevitably he would have gone to prison for a year. Now, he's fortunate because the Defender Right to Protest were there, and someone from, that, from, uh, from the campaign saw him there and had a chat with him and uh, introduced him to me, and we decided to put the thing off for that day and have a look at the evidence and see, and see what could happen. And bravely, later on, he decides to fight the case, despite the fact he's on video, um, hitting uh, the inside of Millbank uh, window with a, with a hammer. And um, the defence barrister sums up his case saying, don't hold this honesty against him in interview, and don't let the prosecution have their pound of flesh. He'd admitted criminal damage, don't let them have their pound of flesh for this violent disorder, for which he would have gone to prison for even longer because he decided bravely to fight it. And I'm delighted to say that the jury came back after two and a half hours and acquitted uh, Paul Akinyemi. <laughs> but he, his case is not unique. And I just before I come to the figures, I want to just deal with Sir Paul Stevenson, because he, in his resignation speech, he said this, the professional 
and restrained approach to unexpected levels of violence in the student demonstration. That's what was him describing his role in that, in that, on those four demonstrations. I'll just deal, first of all, with professional. Um, there's only one slide to deal with that. That was the <laughs> police that sent in the royal car. Nobody else, the police decided to send into the royal car into the middle of the student protest at its height. Uh, I wouldn't call that professional. You may be interested to know that no one I'm aware of has been prosecuted uh, for that. The second is the question of violence, unexpected levels of violence. 60 protesters were injured, only 20 officers. I'm always, I'm always suspect about when officers say they're injured because they sort of say a little knee twinge and then they're off for a day or something. You never quite know what, what that means when they say they're injured. Um, but 60 uh, protesters against 20, you can see what went on um, in, in, that, uh, in that. And it, it, it brings back, as a, as a wonderful quote from Robert Mark, who was a, a horrible Met commissioner in the 1970s, and it describes exactly what they do. He said, the real art of policing a free society is to win by appearing to lose. And that's exactly what they do. Now, while, this, while they're beating up protesters, they complain about, about the violence when it's actually them that, that, that are meeting it out uh, in, in far more um, capacity. And the last thing is this idea of the police being restrained. 300 young students, mainly students, all of, all of good character, pretty much, were arrested over the student protests. Uh, protesting against an appalling uh, lie by the Lib Dems that they weren't going to introduce this in the first place. If you said that in Burma, 300 students have been arrested of good character because they're protesting against a, a, an appalling policy, people would be up in uproar. But that's what, that's what happened here. Which police, when they say restrained, uh, Nina's mentioned it, but I was having to deal um, in my other part of my work, I do actually deal with terrorism suspects. I was having to deal with counter-terrorism officers handing out cautions <coughs> to students for, for, um, for, for, uh, for trespass. I mean, it's extraordinary that, the, that this is restrained policing, that they have to get the counter-terrorism unit in to, to deal with uh, people in that, in that situation. But most importantly is the issue of charging, what they decide to charge with. The Public Order Act has five sections, riot the worst, section one, the least worst, section five, disorderly conduct. For riot you can get ten years, Disor uh, disorderly conduct you can just get a fine. The definitions of those sections are pretty much the same actually, I mean when you look at them in terms of an incident that may happen on a protest, that they could charge with any of those sections in my view, they're so broad and opaque but they jump to section two, violent disorder, the second most serious, which has a five-year maximum sentence. And that's what they've been doing in the last three or four years, using this section two to clamp down on protests. Um, and Paul Akinyemi uh, was, was part of that story. Now, I, I just deal, what happened particularly two years ago was after the Gaza protest, suddenly, 70 people, 72 people were charged with violent disorder, an extraordinary thing. Almost all of them of good character who were, who were angry about what was going on in, in Gaza. And why, why do the police feel so confident to suddenly use these powers in, in such mass numbers? There are two reasons. One is this is because this is what they've always done. And since the police were created, their, their role, in, in my view, has always been to, to, to squash dissent and protest. Uh, they, they were created, the Met was the first one that was created, unsurprisingly, to also protect the city in the 1830s. And in 1839, the Met went up to Birmingham to crush a protest by the Chartists in the bullring there. I mean, I don't know, the Met, when I last looked, the metropolitan area doesn't extend to Birmingham, but they went <laughs> out of their area to go and smash, smash up the Chartist protest. But I think there's something else that's given them confidence. It's not just that historically they always do this. It was the role of the last government, the Labour government, that gave them that confidence. For every day that Labour was in office, they introduced a criminal law. I mean, quite appalling. There were 17 criminal justice acts, more than the whole of the post-war post era. The whole of the post-war era, Labour just churning out this legislation. Anything the police asked for, they got. From, from Blair 
and, and from Brown. And that gave the police confidence to start using more of these powers. Hundreds of thousands of search, stop and search under the Terrorism Act, which has now been abolished, that stop and search. Not a single person um, was, was uh, stopped and searched and prosecuted for terrorism, but hundreds of thousands were, were allowed to be stopped and has, hassled and harassed by the police. Now, um, I just, they haven't all had it their own way, and I just, these are estimates, right? So don't, but uh, I'm grateful for Legal Defence Monitoring Group in particular for the figures that they've managed to pull together from, on the student protests 2010. But there you have the use of violent disorder. Pretty similar numbers charged from the Gaza protests and the student protests, but you'll see there's a, a dramatic difference with it, it, the number of people that went to prison out of that. And that comes back to uh, what Alfie was talking about uh, and Nina about that in the, in the meantime, what happened in November 2010 was that the Defender Right to Protest was set up, also Legal Defence Monitoring Group doing good work as well, and offered support for those people who'd been charged and people had collective assistance. It was vital that people could pick out things that were working in each other's cases and, and uh, could share the good experiences and they had uh, decent uh, representation. And that made a massive difference between the people who were isolated before, what Alfie was saying, how isolating it is when you're taken into a police station, you don't have any support, you don't know anyone. And that's why it's so vital within the campaign that there is that, that is passed out to people who may ever be arrested, that they know never, never talk to the police until you've got a solicitor, you know, keep quiet until you talk to a solicitor and then you can be properly advised and make sure, you know, you're, you're catered for in that way. Um, now, uh, I think... I think that really covers it, but I'll just finish on this. Um, you may not be able to read that at the back, but and I don't know if Alfie's seen this before, but that is a, a wonderful picture from Tahir Square with a solidarity for Alfie Meadows from Tahir Square on the left there. Um, we drew inspiration from the student protests, so did they, but we particularly drew inspiration, inspiration from that. There's another thing that's happened this week, um, which I just want to tell you, because it's an amazing story. I worked on this case uh, a bit, but in Italy 10 years ago, there was the most appalling police violence against some protesters in, in Genoa. Um, and the, uh, the police basically went into a school and just smashed everybody up who was staying in the school um, and almost killed um, a, a lad called Mark Cavell outside. And they'd been fighting for all these years for justice. And the, the, the Italian legal system is slightly, it takes slightly longer than ours even, and uh, I can say on Thursday that the Court of Appeal upheld the convictions against those police officers. Uh, a wonderful result in terms of international protest. A, a very rare. And those officers... <laughs> and those officers are now out of a job. Okay. <laughs> Well, I work in the criminal defence, uh, in criminal defence. I'll have the um, privilege of representing uh, several people who have been involved in protests. And uh, I myself uh, come from a funny, uh, funny way of, uh, I arrived in a strange way to, to work in criminal defence. I was charged with incitement to riot due to the poll tax uh, situation. And uh, one of the things that I found it necessary to argue with the people I was arrested with was a very simple fact that the state is not neutral. If you ever see a policeman go down to a picket line, draw his stick, and bash the boss, I'll buy you a beer. If <laughs> you ever see the state act in a neutral fashion, it won't be it won't be a capitalist state, I can tell you that. When they came for us with a poll tax, I think they were in a very similar situation that the ruling class are in today. They were scared. There were riots taking place right across right across the country. It wasn't just a big London riot. There were riots in Norwich, there were riots in Brighton, there were riots in Colchester, what they called riots. And again, that's how they stretch it. We were violent. We were violent in our blue souls. They were geared up on horseback, exactly the same I've heard here just now, pulling people off their feet by their hair, and wondered why 
people responded and resisted the state. We are right to resist. The day the police go down and start beating up the bosses, we can count them as neutral. We have to unite our forces. The good work of Matt and people like him, we really do need that. When we were arrested, we collected £10,000 a long time ago, so it was a lot of money. With that money, that money came from trade union people who supported us. Okay? This was um, a ragtag of us. And uh, so that was that money and that solidarity that kept our morale. None of us actually, well, a few did go down out of the 16 of us we charged, but by and large, we beat them back. And we beat them back with solidarity. Our comrades in Norwich coming to the picket lines outside the court, showing the judge that whatever decision he came to, there were people watching him. Trade union banners flying, megaphones making a row. So that is really what we need to do in order to, to help Alfie, is to make sure they know we're there, make sure that we're not frightened to protest, even though we might be scared, you know, don't let them see when you're scared. Don't let them see, don't let them see that we're worried. We need to worry them. Uh, hi, I just want to um, bring to light an issue that has been not very well publicised in the media, surprisingly, is that, I don't know whether you all remember, in the riots, I think it was on the student demos, when they raided Millbank, my, my eldest brother, uh, who was one with the chair, throwing it through the window, and depicted in many papers, he, he, was, he was arrested for that, he was charged, they managed to, they wanted to charge him on what was called theft by finding. <laughs> what that entails is taking a police hat and putting it on your head. <laughs> um, but fortunately, he wasn't charged with any sort of violent conduct or anything like that. But he was given 600 hours of community service. Or as they like to call it, community payback. He did that, it was in fact quite degrading. It entails just painting fences all day. Once that was finished, on the same evening that was finished, he was then arrested for more theft, or supposed theft, and he's now on remand in Felton. He's been in remand for three months. The people who have prosecuted him are unwilling to give evidence in court. The issue I also have is that while he's in there, he's on 23-hour lockdown a day. <coughs> and this 23-hour lockdown is not for him being violent. He actually gets a lot of compliments from Staff for being intelligent there and for applying themselves in courses. The issue they have is they're understaffed and they're overcrowded. He has actually resorted to attending religious classes that he does no longer believe in <laughs> in order to get out of his cell for an hour a day. An hour, that is what it's worth to, for, to throw away his beliefs in order to get some sanity. He's not even allowed outside. And this is someone who is on the mark. And he's done, he's done nothing wrong to anybody. It's similar to the story Matt has, has mentioned of Paul and Kiemi. The issue that I also have is that the, the police commissioner sent a letter to our house, even though he's no longer there because he's in prison, mm. stating that he's no longer allowed, he should not be, well, stating, asking him not to, to turn up for any demos. This just shows the level of incompetence they have. They don't even know that he's in prison. <laughs> but the important thing to remember is that he is he's now on remand and he's waiting at court aid. But his struggle is our struggle. If we share his struggle, we can Hiya. Um, I am Rebecca from Birmingham. Um, um, I don't know if people know that there is a um, West Midlands um, against police privatisation. It's a campaign we started because unfortunately uh, West Midlands and Surrey police are facing privatisation quite openly. And uh, we, a um, group of people, set up um, this campaign to, to fight that. Um, just the way how I attend the police uh, authority meeting and it's quite scary what they're talking. They don't, they say, Obviously, they say it's not about cuts. It's about changing the way how they're working, which is talking about uh, sharing the um, uh, information and globalizing information. And the companies that are flying is the companies. One of the companies is the um, uh, G4S. Probably some people heard about them. Uh, and the other one is uh, KBR, which is uh, dealing with Guantanamo uh, prison. And uh, the, the third one, well, it's all ugly companies basically, and you can imagine if the way how we're dealing with the police at the moment, if that goes through, they, they're trying this in Surrey and Birmingham, West Midlands, and if that goes through, all the other policing will go under that. 
Uh, it's quite a scary picture because we're going to a period that people will fight. We're going to you know, have more protests and more of that. And they're getting gear in as well and getting ready for that. And they, they're privatizing that and getting more armed, ugly companies to run the police. So I'm just worried how we can pack all the campaigns towards that. I mean, you know, I'd like to speak to, to, to people and try to work together because we're a very small group of people and we're trying to look a bit bigger and muscly. We're <laughs> 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 for progress on the 12th of uh, July, but, you know, I'd like to, to probably make it more a bit official work with, with whoever campaigning against police in all different forms. Um, um, there is a point I wanted to say, but I forgot, but thank you, everybody. <laughs> Hello, my name is Brian from Manchester. Uh, last August, uh, I'd gone into Manchester on a, an impromptu UK on cut demonstration. Sat down with them and we decided we we're going to occupy the Santander Bank to bring attention to the piss take of these bankers. At the same time, the appointment of uh, Sir Philip Green, the biggest tax avoid you could ever imagine, uh, saying how he can introduce more and more tougher austerity measures. So it's a no-brainer, I'm going in this bank. So we operated, we, we occupied very quickly, not an aggravated trespass, we were careful about that. We sat down, closed the bank. Then, then the inspector came, and I was the oldest, which is pretty usual. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, he asked us to leave, I said, uh, one moment, I'll discuss it with my comrades, mm -hmm. and then they're up for leaving. Uh, and they said, no, we're not going to leave. He said, you've got two minutes to leave or you're in trouble. So I said, leave it with me. So I talked to the comrades. I said, I think it's, it's made a point now. Leave us to that side. Let's clear off. You know, we've done what we wanted to do. So I said, okay, we're ready to go. He says, too late. And he pointed an officer each to each of us, grabbed us, threw us over the desk, hands behind their back. I was still upset by it. Uh, we kept me like that for about a couple of hours while well, they got these special punishment boxes. They're called sweat boxes. They could have taken us away in neat bands, but they got these dreadful boxes and with a claustrophobia. They trapped in them with this big, thick, fiber glass stuff and you can't move. The good thing, because I was always apprehensive, I thought I was a bit of a claustrophobic person. I thought, well, bloody hell. I'm in now, there's bollocks I can do. <laughs> <laughs> I just have to get on with it. <laughs> and they kept me in that for about two and a half hours. Two and a half hours. Uh, eventually, they took us off to the prison. This desk sergeant, a real tired and bully, you're in here for the next couple of days. You can't keep me in here for a couple of days. I'm doing the Johnny Brooks to Land's End tomorrow, which I was. Psychic. I know, to cut a long story short, uh, they, they, only, they wouldn't let us have solicitors, they, didn't, uh, they wouldn't give us any drinks, I had nothing. Uh, I missed my favourite team's football match that evening and they just yard me about 9, 10 o'clock at night, they just threw us out onto the street. And with the other kids there, they were only young, and they'd taken us about 20 miles out of Manchester. And I said, what are you going to do? He says, we haven't got any money. I said, what do you mean? Well, how are you going to get home? Fortunately, I did. So here you are. There you are. There's some money. So here you are. I'll get the buses back to Manchester. I'll take, if I'm running too long, I'll I've took, I've, I've, but I was so in, incensed. I went to the solicitors a few days later. I said, that was wrongful arrest. I was treated abhorrently. And I, I can't let it rest. Uh, the way, I won't, yeah, I'll cut long story short. So I've been to solicitors, and this is what's important for all of us here, is the solicitors have agreed to take the case up, yes. but what well, they've also said, you're going to need barristers, after a while of leading us in, you know what solicitors are like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> they're agents and solicitors, oof. <laughs> so, yeah, so, right, okay, so, what, what the final implication is, solicitors, they pass you over to barristers, barristers who will defend you for nothing if you haven't transgressed what they fear of as transgression. So I said, great, well let's proceed. He says, but well, you might lose the case. And if you lose the case, the police will charge you. The police will charge you for wasting their time. And it could be quite prohibitive costs. I wasn't on legal aid, some of the other kids were. 
But what they do, what we can actually do, they can go out and get insurance. And if the insurer is assured by the barrister that you're okay, you will get the cost cut. Uh, Ian took what Matt knows, what he thinks the final outcome. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to keep you as short as I can. I just want to say uh, um, we have a, like, a similar campaign in Belgium, and lots of the things I heard here today uh, I can really relate to. And I'm going to give a few examples I could talk the night through, but I'm not going to just two examples. One was these kind of um, no protest zones that you got for the Olympics. We've got the same for the, I, I think it was in the year 2000, we, had the, we hosted the Euro uh, uh, competition. And so we had a, what they call a neutral zone around Parliament. So we aren't, we, we can't uh, protest in front of Parliament. That's quite simple for you. But what, what is interesting is that it was put forward as a temporary measure. measure. It's still there. We're like 12 years later. And it's not going away because they actually extended it to the European institutions. <coughs> So that was the first point I wanted to make, and um, I think it's pretty important to, to keep that in mind, is that the, the street is ours, and we have to fight that. Yes. Second thing is, um, about the question of violence, um, I heard that some protesters were charged for ridiculous offences. We had actually a, a British national who was tried in Belgium a, a few months ago, and got one year of prison, because he supposedly um, violently rebelled against police orders. So how did he violently rebel? He had uh, a drumstick in his hand. That was to be, that's supposed to be a weapon with which he attacked the police officer, which is like armored with a shield and, and a helmet. <laughs> Real danger that, um, um, that, that instrument. So that I'm, I'm not going to go further and, and in the examples of similar stuff we're facing in Belgium and I think quite around, maybe around the globe and in Europe anyway, um, you can see similar campaigns and similar strategies by police being deployed all over the place. And so I think it's really important that we all work together on this and, and see this as, a, as, as an international struggle, like all struggles are. But what I really wanted to say is that the Defend the Right to Protest campaign has really been an inspiration, and I really wanted to thank everyone for all the work you're doing. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rachel. I'm from the Defend the Right to Protest campaign. Um, I just wanted to pick up on Nina's point about um, violence, uh, because I do a lot of court support for Defend the Right to Protest, and I find that one of the most infuriating things is sitting through court case after court case where prosecutions talk about violence and what they really mean is property damage. Um, and yet you also have police officer after police officer willing to stand up and talk about whatever riot or demonstration or protest you know, that case is about how it was the worst day of their lives, the worst day of their careers. They were in serious fear of their personal safety. They were in serious fear of their lives. Um, and most infuriatingly, just hearing that in Alfred Meadows' case, you know, they nearly killed Alfred Meadows and they want to talk about how they were in fear of their lives. Um, and then we also see that kind of bullshit rhetoric in the media as well. And so we use Defend the Right to Protest um, to push an alternative narrative about um, violence because we want to talk about state violence. Um, the police tactics on demonstrations, the thousands of deaths in police custody, um, the tripling of tuition fees, the slashing of EMA, the selling of the NHS, um, job losses, the benefit cuts, which are literally destroying people's lives and if not killing some people. Um, yeah, and, and that damage also is like obviously beyond a repairable window. Um, and I think it, one of the really important things for the campaign as well is to, and one of the things I'm really proud of is that we unite those battles of resistance when people rise up against their different types of oppression. I mean, it was the other week, well, it was this week actually, that Alfie went to um, the inquest of Sean Ring. And after that inquest with, uh, of Sean Ring, that particular day, he went with Sam Ring and the mother of Sean Ring, and they went to the trial of Simon Harwood, um, who, who was accused of killing Ian Tomlinson. Um, and I, w I just want to encourage everyone here to, to get involved with the 
the campaign because I think come the autumn <coughs> term, we're going to see people like Paul Akinyemi um, who are going to fight uh, like they have nothing to lose um, but everything to win and we have to stand by those people. I think the question comes out, doesn't it, about why are the police quite so brutal? Because I think people are really shocked. It's shocking hearing the stories, and it's shocking when you've been on those demos at the first protest. And there is a theory that, particularly the newspapers like, when we get a bit exposed, that actually it's not the whole of the police, not the whole of the police institution, just a few bad apples. I mean, they do roll this theory out a lot, don't they? Actually, even about the bankers. I read a crazy story when the economic crisis began four or five years ago. That actually, it was just to do with one rogue trader in France. And if we got rid of him, it would all be okay. And so the problem is, is it's not about individual bad apples, it's about the whole system. And that whole system is what is being exposed at the moment. Because it wasn't one rogue trader, it wasn't one banker, they were all in it. It wasn't even one of them trying to set the LIBOR rate. The Bank of England is even going to be implicated in trying to set interest rates that affect people's lives. And it wasn't just, you know, some MPs claiming extra expenses. It was right. It wasn't just a bit of phone hacking. It was all previous institutions. And this is where you get to see a real elite at the top expose a time and a time of weird all in it together, except if you're apparently one of the richest 1,000 people in Britain, that's 0.005% of the population, you've increased your wealth by £155 billion in the last three years, whilst we've all been asked to pay for it, and they need to be protected, don't they? Because they're the minority, and that's the role of the police, about how do they protect them from the majority in these armed men of the state, as they usually are, they're often called special bodies of armed people, if you like, who actually protect the private property of that elite. And the point is now, the level of austerity they're demanding from us is so great they can't do it through normal means. That's why they resort to such brutal, horrible methods. But you know what, we've also seen an alternative, because I think it's brilliant here in the distance here, but what about Egypt? What about places where they face massive repression from the state, the dictator, torture, but actually people showed if you're united on the streets, in the workplaces, fighting together, you can not only defend yourself, you can actually topple dictators and start putting something else there. And I think it's been a brilliant meeting. I was so pleased to hear you, Alfie, because I've not had a chance before to hear an individual who's not being crushed by what the state tries to do to us. Because that's what they want to do, stop every individual, take you and individualise you, not being crushed, but equally, we have to put on the agenda. We have to get rid of that system, rid of the system that elite, tiny minority, own all the wealth, need to have a police and a state to stop everybody else, get rid of that, and start the idea that we can win it very differently ourselves without being crushed. I'm from uh, Swiss in University College Dublin uh, in Ireland. Um, I really just have a question for Alfie, I'd just like to echo as well what you said there. It's great to actually hear you I've read about you for so long on the internet, but it's great to actually hear you speak. Um, but I've just got a question really. I just like to want to know what's the role of uh, student union leadership in your case in particular, but also in the other cases and in uh, police violence more generally. Because the one kind of glimpse that we have seen in the, in the last few years, I don't want to keep on harping on about it because it's almost two years ago, but a week before you guys were in, uh, in Millbank, uh, we had a similar action and uh, the first thing of our student union leadership was to do was to condemn uh, the breakaway, condemn uh, the protesters and jump to the side of the police uh, and uh, actually thank the police for how they handled the situation even though some students were hospitalised and some students were uh, arrested. And uh, you know it's it's really you know insulting and I feel it's really you know it hits you hard and it hits all the students really hard, but it's also just fucking stupid in terms of <laughs> tactics when it comes to tackling the state. Because what you're doing is legitimising the state, you're legitimising the course they're implementing, you're legitimising the police, uh, and you're splitting the movement as well. Whereas you know the conservative element of the movement could easily say these lads are done, they're ready to take radical action, and they're we're ready to let them off the leash if uh, if the state doesn't. Uh, uh, pick up the tab and actually listen to listen to what they're saying, listen to about fees and listen to about uh, about cuts as well. And um, they're they're diabolical. The majority of the student leadership in Ireland are uh, from the main Conservative Party people, uh, and they're just used as a vehicle to promote themselves for careers and stuff like that. So I want to know uh, a bit of advice really from uh, the, the, the the English movement. Thanks very much. Okay. Hi. Uh, I'd like to say two little story about uh, Sussex University. Uh, firstly, two years ago, uh, a management basically announced uh, that uh, they wanted to fire 115 people after losing a three million pound uh, investing in a well, very shitty bank at the time. So what happened was well, there was a lot of opposition, a lot of occupation, and one of them resulted basically in what management called a hostage situation. And they basically sent uh, the police on us. They sent 16 riot, riot police cars 
uh, onto us, um, you know, and armed students obviously doing nothing else than protesting um, uh, well peacefully. And then what happened afterwards, well, there was obviously, you know, a lot of beaten up, and that's why, you know, the public police does. And then there was like six students that got suspended because of this. Uh, so, you know, the, the, already, you know, you see management using exactly the same tactic of intimidation that the, well, the government is doing. And what we did was, you know, to organize, uh, you know, a lot of protests, and we had like an eight-day occupation uh, and a one-day strike action by the, by the lecturers. And then, you know, the six students got reinstated. So that was, you know, really the students... <laughs> Uh, but anyway, so this really disunity between students and the staff really, you know, well, helped us to get them reinstated. The second story is about, um, you know, because after that there was no bank. So my second story is about Zenon. I don't know if he's in the room. Uh, Zenon is a, is a Sussex University student as well, a comrade who went to protest against the tripling of the fees. And after, you know, this context that is always, uh, that Alfie raised really well about, you know, the, this police violence, well, um, and the scattling, um, Zenon threw a stick, a placard stick. He heard no one, he enjoyed no building, no property whatsoever. He, he got 16 months, you know, for that. And he spent, I think, at least, if I'm correct, four months of it. And so what we did during those four months was to really, well, thanks to defend the right to protest, you know, was to organize a, a, a very big campaign. Um, so we passed, you know, we had a, a massive uh, um, a meeting, we passed motion at the student union, uh, we had a, organized a mass meeting with, uh, called Justice for Zenon, with Zenon's mother, uh, John McDonald, there was Alfie and Nina, it was absolutely amazing. And anyway, and after four months, you know, he was released and we welcomed him back. So the point I, I want to make is that, you know, those two stories that, you know, whether it's the government or our, manage, our management, you know, in our, in our colleges or university, they're going to use the same tactics, you know, they're going to try to intimidate us and, you know, those tactics of victimization, scapegoating, and they'll use the police, they'll use those pigs to come and beat us up, to, to, you know, to prevent us from saying that, well, we don't agree, uh, you know, what we're doing. And I think what we need to continue doing is like, you know, in support to, uh, for Alfie, Zenon and all the others, because there are many others, is to, is to continue to protest, to continue mm -hmm. to defend what is, you know, in the end, uh, a right to this, uh, yeah, a right to protest. Thank you. Uh, yeah, all right. I'm, I'm from uh, Birmingham, and uh, last year, basically, someone um, related to uh, some members of my family, uh, Kingsley Ward Brown, um, basically uh, died in police custody. And um, he's, um, I think he's probably worth mentioning though in history police that he's also he, he was also um, black and um, he uh, he called up police basically and he was, um, he was basically, basically he, was, he was scared of um, someone following him or something or sort of something um, you know to that effect. He called them up. They um, basically uh, beat him up in front of a member of his family, uh, took him into custody, and then um, sectioned him when he has no uh, history of like, mental health problems. And uh, he died um, in the mental hospital after, um, you know, suffering more injuries on the way, being transported by the police to the mental hospital. And uh, it's just, it's just bastards, aren't they, basically? But, um, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just going to tell people that um, there's a campaign around Birmingham to, um, could, um, uh, his body still hasn't been uh, released, and there's a campaign, there's a protest on the 18th of August, I think, um, in Birmingham, uh, outside Westminster Main Police Station, to sort of, you know, protest against the absolutely reprehensible behaviour of the police. If you search on Facebook, Birmingham Strong Justice for all, the number four, and it's all one word, it'll come up, um, if you're interested in sort of learning more about it. And I just thought I'd um, say a bit about sort of linking the police to the law, which would be really quick. Um, like, basically, I think like the law is not meant to interact with ordinary people. It's something created by the ruling class, and it's, uh, it's created for the ruling class, and it's used to basically repress ordinary people. So the whole point of the law in this sort of context is it's meant to be sort of alienated from us, and it's not meant to be made there. And I think that's one of the key reasons why the police are so violent and are so racist because they are a like, physical reflection of that sort of dogma and the injustice of our justice system and until we get rid of the whole thing we won't get rid of the fucking racist stuff back. So, yeah. yeah, absolutely right, they are bastards and I tell you when you work for, uh, through the Defend the Right to uh, protest campaign and you sit in the courts and you watch young people being lined up or sent uh, uh, down to prison for prison terms of up to 36 months for 
for throwing a placard stick that hit and hurt no one, for actually fighting uh, for their future, for fighting against the real destruction that the Tories wreaking on people's lives. It makes you incredibly angry and through the campaign. So many people, you can't go to a meeting now where you don't have people standing up saying, you know, my friend, my brother, this is what happened to him. My friend, my brother, my sister died in, died in, died in custody. So they are bastards, but they're also weak bastards as well. And we should remember this, that their violence comes from a weakness. The reality of it is, is that Milbank scared the shit out of them. For a few months, the police ran rings around them and we nearly brought the, brought the government down. And that's why the repression. That's why you have the collective punishment. And we sat in the court in Alfred's trial and saw the footage of Westminster Bridge where the cops just get, kept crushing people closer and closer together and they're saying you're going to kill someone and the police carried on. And when the uh, silver commander who was in charge was asked about it, he said this has had nothing to do with collective punishment. And when he was asked, well, what are your thoughts about the G20 protest? Of course, we know Ian Tomlinson died in the G20 protest. Did anything go wrong? Oh, nothing necessarily went wrong during the G20 protest. But that's what it comes from. It was about collective punishment. But also, it came from a fear that what the students were doing would, would spread. Because when we talk about them breaking the austerity consensus, the truth is, up and down the country, people were rooting for the students. People want the students to win. And despite their attempt to demonise and isolate the students, actually the public remained with them. And I think that's why the figures that Matt shows are incredibly important when you compare the Gaza uh, outcomes to the student outcomes. Because actually, what was different, partly the climate's different, and there's a sense in which we're all being attacked by austerity, and therefore when one group fights back and they're attacked, actually there is sympathy with people. And that's really good ground to build serious solidarity, serious solidarity, uh, serious solidarity campaigns. And it's partly the success of that that is borne out in those figures. And we have to drive that success home. And that means being on the court on the 29th of October when Alfie goes to trial. Why are they going for Alfie? Because he has become a symbol of the re reality of the brutality of the cops. And they think if they can send Alfie down, they de delegitimise Alfie and what he represents for so many of us in terms of the nastiness of the police. And so we have to make sure that Alfie wins. But we also have to make sure that their nightmares come true. And I just want to finish by with this. I don't know if anyone's uh, followed this, the thing about the Olympics and the secret exercise that they carried out. It was a disaster exercise. It's sunny weather and all the rest of it. Anyway, the participants are asked to prepare for a few things. Uh, they say, imagine uh, that you had some traffic problems. Then you'd be aware that the voice of the poor, a new protest, is developing and having marches around the country. Suddenly the Olympics become the focus of discontent for protest groups like the Cabbage Group. Uh, then you have a public incident order breaking out in Coventry during an anti-war demo. And as if that's not enough, French intelligence warn of a new anti-capitalist party organising a blockade of Calais against the corporate takeover in the Olympics. That was a real disaster exercise that the police were put through in preparation for the Olympics. That is what they're scared about. They're scared about that kind of resistance coming together. The, the, the resilience of the Milbank uh, protests, the power of the trade union demonstrations and the strikes, and the anger of the uprisings that we saw in the riots. In the autumn, we have to bring those things together to bring those bastards back. <laughs> really, which is listening to all the stories and all of these experiences that you know, we've talked a lot about the uh, the kind of isolation and, and the you know the way people's sort of spirits is, is you know just you know the structure is set up to do that to you and to us and and I think we have to really be to say all the time that there's no shame in protesting, there's no shame in being arrested, there's no shame in going to court, there's no shame in going to prison, you know, there's no shame of damaging property, and there's no shame in taking property. It's it's always going to be much less than what they do on a daily basis, and I think. You know, it's when you've got movements like UK and Cup, for example, which was mentioned, you know, part of why did they try and crush that movement? Well, it, because it had popular support. You know, people were, were, were behind the idea of, of, of you know, uh, uh, getting people to pay the fucking taxes. You know, we're supposed to be taxpayers, you know, but this is this right wing fucking figure that's, you know, supposed to be constantly upset about anyone claiming benefits and anyone taking jobs. And, you know, the taxpayer is this kind of, you know, a right wing figure. Um, you know, that people are supposed to identify with and, and to actually take that and say, you know, yeah, well, we do pay tax, you know, some of us anyway, and, and, and those people at the top should pay fucking tax. 
And that was a popular campaign, and they had to destroy it. And the way they did that was by arresting people, by criminalizing. It doesn't even matter if they got the conviction. They got the conviction in some cases and not in others. It's not about that. When you've got a popular movement with even people like Polly Toynbee um, going to, you know, UK and Cup protests and so on, you know, you have to shut it down. It's also an information gathering exercise. You know, what the police are doing is that when you get these kind of different protest movements, you know, they're trying to find out how they work. You know, they've got very crap models about how protests are organised. They're always looking for ringleaders, and they do, in fact, target people that they think are, you know, the charismatic student or whatever, and they go after these people. But they're frightened, they're terrified, as Hannah said, um, by, you know, these new forms of, uh, um, you know, protest against austerity, and they know it's coming from everywhere. And um, this, this exercise that Hannah mentioned, uh, I think Voice of the Poor is a great name for a new uh, protest. <laughs> so we should set that up. But, um, yeah, no shame. Uh, thank you for all the, um, the great comments. And um, just go through them really to get the um, the just on the international um, struggle and the um, you know the you, you see on the on the on the news or the TV the same images of these riot police. You know they could be the same ones you see in London could be in Cairo or Greece or Spain um, uh, charging out uh, you know with Egypt or or Greece or say uh, Chile or uh, Quebec. Um, and uh, the airport, you, you see them performing the same function in, in, in each situation, attacking um, attacking protest movements, attacking pickets, attacking people in the streets, and um, yeah, it's obvious what they're about. Um, so I think that yeah, the, the prospect of linking up these um, uh, defence campaigns is, uh, is brilliant. I think the strategies for, for dealing with them is really important. Um, uh, on the NUS, obviously, um, we had the uh, uh, Calling atrocious Aaron Porter, who condemned um, the Mill Bank straight away. Um, and uh, uh, we've, this time around, this um, got Liam Burns, and he's actually supported the feminist protests, actually come out and um, uh, defend the students, and that's um, obviously a big improvement that you can't take any for granted, you know. But I think the pressure we've put on him uh, has been useful, and we need to obviously there's a big protest coming up in November, which is uh, very good. And it just it would be nice if uh, you, could, you could know that. Out on the streets and protests, but you won't be condemned by your union leadership or something. I think you know, it does make a difference. Um, um, and uh, I suppose, um, uh, thank you so much for uh, 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 John Tipple from the poll tax. Um, that's obviously a great inspiration for us, and uh, we need to have a new poll tax thing. We were in the housing crisis talk, and people were talking about that as a new issue, but basically, that's a brilliant. Um, uh, model of the, the defense campaigns they organize for um, brilliant. We've, we've, uh, I've personally looked at them as, as inspiration for um, what we're doing. That was another example of solidarity and um, fighting back against say, repression, and it obviously you get one. And people were prepared to take risks and prepared to go out and defy the laws when necessary, and it paid off, and I think that's incredibly important for us. Um, and um, finally, I mean, the, so the, the obvious uh, deaths and um, Police custody we talked about, and I want to think, that, I think that's so important um, uh, for us to get behind as well. Um, I really think that that's got to be part of our, part of our autumn. Um, so, yeah, I want to say uh, thank you everyone, and it's, uh, uh, the support is amazing. So, that is so important to me, but really important coming into the autumn um, because of all the struggle. Um, I just want to deal with um, two points. One is that the police will always try it on, they'll always try and use a new power or, or a new tactic until they're pushed back. Um, I, I remember about 10 years ago going to an organising meeting before a big stop the war march and the police were insisting that the march start from some ridiculous place and we sort of packed the meeting and had to force them back. It's a little example of what they, they just do it all the time and so that's what they're doing with violent disorder, we have to push them back and I think to a great extent we have embarrassed them over a number of these cases and uh, even the BBP woke up and, and said that he would look at the issue. Um, the issue of letters getting out is quite extraordinary. This is another example of something they just invented. To send letters to people who have not been uh, charged or have not been convicted is quite extraordinary. I, mean, I had a guy who was acquitted because they couldn't really get their videos together and he was acquitted a couple of days uh, before, the, uh, before the trial. And he got a letter 
from the police saying he wasn't welcome at next then I, I think a good tactic would be to write a letter to them. Secondly, I wanted to deal with what we just addressed was, was violence. Um, the, the, the question that we put back to them again. How many police officers have been killed in custody? None. None. Yes. Um, how many protesters? I mean, how many police have been killed on protests? None. We remember Ian Tomlinson. We remember Kevin Gately. We remember Blair Beach. This is this is when they talk about violence. It's what they were saying about earlier about how they make try and make it look like you're losing when you're winning. It's a constant uh, battle, a propaganda battle. Uh, when the wretched Sir Paul Stevenson came on the telly on the fourth demo and said every reasonable person could see we're dealing with a violent protest. At the same time, a bloody horse child was going in and terrifying uh, the life out, even out of the media who were, who were reporting it. Um, and just lastly, the, the best argument on the violence is that <laughs> when it's a hundred, hundreds of miles away, um, it's all right to support the protest if it looks like it's inevitably going to win. But when it's here, they don't. Uh, and, and, and the idea that the you, you should turn to democracy, they say, you should use a democratic process, when the democratic process said, we will not bring in tuition fees, and then did, is a complete joke. Mm -hmm.